Welcome to a webinar from NIOSH Healthy Work Design Council titled Climatologic Conditions, Chronic Conditions in the Work, Emerging Evidence and Its Implications. My name is Dr. Marie Ann Rosenberg. For those who do not know me, I am an assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing and a core faculty member of the University of Michigan's NIOSH funded ERC program. It is my pleasure to serve as moderator for today's webinar. On behalf of the NIOSH Healthy Work Design Council, we are delighted to have you with us today. I am excited to introduce you to today's speakers. Today's featured speakers are Drs. Paul Schultz, Cecilia Sorensen, and June Spector. Dr. Paul Schultz is a consultant and former director of the Division of Science Integration and co-manager of the Nanotechnology Research Center at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Dr. Schultz has 40 years of experience in conducting research and developing guidance on occupational cancer, nanomaterials, risk communication, workplace well-being and genetics. He also has examined the convergence of occupational safety and health and green chemistry and sustainability. Dr. Cecilia Sorensen is a director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education at Columbia University. Dr. Sorensen received her Doctor of Medicine degree from Drexel University College of Medicine and completed a four-year emergency medicine residency at Denver Health. Following residency training, she completed a two-year fellowship in climate change and human health policy with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Her work focuses on the intersection of climate change and health and how policy solutions clinical actions and education can build resilience in vulnerable communities. She currently serves in the, on the working group for the National Academy of Medicine's Climate and Human Health Initiative. Dr. June Spector is a physician scientist with a focus on the prevention and management of adverse health outcomes related to heat exposure for working populations. She has been a faculty member at the University of Washington since 2012, and is a researcher at the Washington State Department of Labor and Industry Safety and Health Assessment and Research for Prevention SHARP program. Without further ado, I will now pass this virtual podium to Dr. Schultz. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. It's a pleasure to be here and talk to you today and set the stage for the discussion of occupational hazards uh, that are climate related. I want to acknowledge uh, my co-author, uh, uh, Brenda Jacklich. Next, please. When we talk about climate change and worker hazards, uh, this is not something that has been evident for a long time. And indeed, prior to 2009, there really wasn't much in the literature that involved a comprehensive characterization of the occupational uh, hazards related to climate and, uh, and to climate change. There was uh, individual hazard uh, literature, but nothing that really looked at it in totality. Broad views were lacking. Next, please. And so we developed this model of uh, seven categories of occupational hazards that linked climate with health and safety effects through these kinds of hazards. And I'm going to go through each of them, ambient temperature, air pollution, radiation, extreme weather, vector-borne diseases and expanded habitats, uh, industrial transitions and emerging industries, and changes in the built environment. Next, please. Uh, it's first, though, it's important, I think, to realize why workers are at risk of occupational safety and health effects from uh, climate change. First of all, they're likely to have more and greater exposure than the general public. They also may uh, be working in situations where their employers are not sufficiently informed or prepared to institute adequate risk management programs. Employers are used to managing chemicals in the workplace or uh, 
preventing traumatic injuries, but they're not necessarily uh, experienced in preventing exposure to climate related conditions. And then finally, up until uh, even now, to some extent, there hasn't been major emphasis in uh, mitigation plans by states or organizations or companies uh, related to workers. So for this reason, there is uh, less preventive activity related to workers. Next. Next. So the hazards to workers followed in these seven categories. The first one is increased ambient temperature. Uh, next, we know that the uh, global mean temperature is increasing and it has increased in the last hundred years. Next. And it's leading to heat related injuries uh, and illnesses and deaths. And indeed, uh, workers who work outside, particularly construction workers, farm workers are particularly at risk. Next. There's also the development of a variety of uh, new conditions related to uh, heat exposure. And one is uh, chronic disease, chronic kidney disease of unknown origin uh, seen in all around the equator area in workplaces. Here, uh, sugarcane workers in Nicaragua. Next, please. And while the actual cause of this condition is not well known. It's apparent that heat stress is a critical component of, of this activity. And indeed, this has been termed the, one of the, the first major epidemic, uh, which may be due to climate change. Uh, and it's uh, affecting lots of people around the world. Next, please. Uh, next, we see increased air pollution. Next. Uh, the Critical issue in air pollution is that uh, it's uh, related in part to the uh, increase in global warming. Uh, we're seeing particular, uh, particularly growing concentrations of pollutants, uh, particularly uh, ground level ozone. And indeed, uh, ground level ozone, uh, which is critically, uh, uh, which affects workers in, in critical ways in terms of lung function, exacerbating asthma, uh, and leading to premature mortality is increasing in the summertime. And so uh, this is a critical uh, component of the air pollution hazard. Additionally, all those kinds of uh, things that are released by plants in terms of pollen are also uh, uh, considered air pollution and the length and severity of the pollen season is increasing. Next, please. In terms of radiation, next, please. Uh, we see that there's a complex interaction between the greenhouse gases and uh, climate change and uh, the depletion of stratospheric ozone as opposed to ground level ozone. And we're seeing then, hence, this is the classic hole in the atmosphere. We're seeing the classic, then we're seeing uh, an increase in UV radiation. Uh, it affects all people, but people who are outside even more. And there are at least 60,000, th these are old data, but there were 60,000 premature deaths in uh, 2000. And exposure to UV radiation results in skin cancer, eye damage, and immune suppression. Next, please. Extreme weather is a critical feature that we're seeing due to the confluence of, uh, of temperature and, next please. And uh, the uh, kinds of conditions uh, that are occurring include storms and floods, landslides, droughts, and wildfires. Workers are dying in these workers who are uh, responders, uh, plus workers who are employed in conditions and situations where those kinds of things happen. And indeed, they present, uh, particularly to people who are responding to doing cleanup, doing uh, remedial work, uh, or they're working long hours, they're suffering uh, physical fatigue, and in many cases, medical, medical stress and fatigue. Next, please. Vector-borne diseases is another category, and 
here we see that uh, the habitats of uh, creatures, uh, insects particularly, is expanding due to the change in temperature. And so there's a broader range where these uh, creatures live. They're affecting more people. Uh, we're also seeing a broader range of, of uh, allergens and molds poisonous plants and reptiles. All of these particularly affect uh, uh, outdoor workers, but they also affect workers going to work as well in some cases. Next slide, please. A critical piece is the uh, hazards that result from industrial transitions and emerging industries. Uh, as we try to prevent uh, climate related effects and switch to greener technologies that we see a lot of indirect effects that were not expected. Uh, the uh, whole issue of job insecurity, I mean, and the change, uh, the impact on, on whole sectors, the coal industry, for example, and as a result of the, the attempts to move to a uh, non-fossil fuel kind of situation. Also, many of the, many of the green industries, uh, solar and wind also have hazards. They're not totally uh, hazard free. Plus, we're going to see uh, other emerging industries, biodiesel, and indeed nuclear is probably going to be a transitional technology uh, that we will still have to deal with the issues related to that. Also, there are hazards in uh, various kinds of recycling events. So there's a lot of in indirect effects of uh, preventing climate related hazards uh, that are, are, are uh, not there. So next slide, I have to go. Uh, finally, there's changes in the built environment. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there just to say that uh, it's critical that we uh, consider not only the physical effects, but the cumulative effects of all these hazards, and they in, in many cases lead to mental uh, fatigue and mental problems. With that, I'll stop and we can pick up the, the rest of uh, what I was going to say in the questions and pass it over to Cecilia. Thank you so much, Paul, for laying out that framework. This is this is such a, a huge topic, and it's really hard to uh, to really get to the whole scope of it. But you you've really uh, got us a great framework here. So I'm going to be talking about about the impacts of climate change on worker health and, and expanding the framework that, uh, that Dr. Schulte just lay out. So when we're thinking about the impacts of climate change on health, you know the one of the, I said, the first things we consider is in addition to these workplace hazards which we're seeing in the blue circle, we also know that each individual worker has unique vulnerabilities um, to climate change. So for example, thinking about their age, their gender, uh, their comorbidities, the medications that they take, all these things are gonna impact an individual worker's susceptibility to climate change. And so we're thinking, we're thinking about worker health protections. We need to be taking these things into account. So for example, we know that older folks, um, especially those who have underlying heart problems or underlying pulmonary issues are gonna be way more vulnerable to the impacts of heat and poor air quality. And so this is something that needs to be factored in when we're thinking about a worker's vulnerability. The other piece of this circle is thinking about community level factors, right? So for example, what is the situation for workers in terms of their access to healthcare, in terms of their transportation? Is a community prepared to deal with a disaster such as a flood or, or a hurricane or a wildfire? And that is also gonna impact um, how well an individual is going to do in their workplace. And then we also need to think about societal factors. So for example, underlying systemic racism and other issues which affect a person or a worker's health in addition to occupational um, and worker health policies. So for example, one of the big issues that's currently being debated is do we need a national um, heat standard for work? We currently don't have one. Um, uh, and that is going to affect, you know, on a societal level, how susceptible um, or vulnerable workers are to climate related health impacts. 
So what we're looking at here is what I would say is like a total worker health approach, whereby we know that in the workplace, we're going to see new vulnerabilities or sorry, new exposures to climate change. But that's just one piece of the puzzle in terms of an individual's health and what impacts it on a larger scale. And so I would sort of challenge us to be thinking um, broadly about health as it relates to climate change and worker health and thinking about how workplaces can interact with these other factors that impact individuals' um, ultimate health outcomes. The second thing I wanna talk about is, is this realization that you know, in the outside of this diagram, we're looking at those climate-related exposures that Dr. Schulte uh, outlined, but it's important to keep in mind that we're not being faced with just one of these exposures exposures at a time, we're being faced with these in a compounding manner. I mean, just as an example, if you think about the Pacific Northwest heat wave, which happened last summer, we saw this massive heat wave, which impacted an incredibly large region in the Pacific Northwest. And then right in the aftermath of that, there were wildfires, right? So we saw these, these compounding disasters, which were affecting areas. And so when we're thinking about worker protections, it's not just enough to say, okay, water quality is going to be compromised or air quality is going to be compromised. It's really, um, it's a complex interrelated system um, that is the environment that is going to impact workers. And so we need to be keeping track of that. The last piece I want to talk about is thinking about work across the lifespan. So we know that we're undergoing this, this green revolution, this, this changing in industries whereby we're hoping to transition off of fossil fuels towards more um, environmentally sustainable industries such as solar, such as nuclear, such as wind. Um, so how can we support workers in those transitions when certain industries are drying up in one area, but then there's job opportunities in other? How can we support workers through these transitions? That's incredibly important. We're also seeing emerging industries around this increasing number of disasters that are happening worldwide. So for example, over the past 10 years, there have been uh, We've been tracking or NOAA has been tracking these billion dollar disasters and just last year we had over 20 disasters just in the United States which each caused over a billion dollars in property damage and around these disasters we're seeing these industries um, kind of sprouting up that are taking advantage of FEMA money taking advantage of insurance payout money and often these are very high risk jobs that are being taken by unskilled laborers, um, potentially who do not have proper documentation. And so we need to be thinking really carefully about these emerging industries that are coming up in response to climate change and how we can put worker health protections in um, so people are not getting injured at work. And the last piece I want to talk about is mental health. And this is really an emerging issue, you know, across the board, not just in occupational health, but occupational health is really a place where we have a possibility to address it because when people have stable livelihoods, they tend to do better in terms of their mental health. But workers are being subject to interruptions um, in their jobs because of emerging industries, because of disasters, because of forced migration, and all these factors are making people's livelihoods much more turbulent than they had been in the past. And so really thinking about how does how do can we as occupational health specialists support the mental health of workers in this complex ecosystem of rapid climate changes that are having so many other impacts. So just to kind of um, dial out the view there, think about these different factors. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to be here today, and I will turn it over to June. Thanks so much, and thank you to the two prior speakers for covering so much ground. What I'd like to focus on in the few minutes now actually is looking at things more through a prevention lens. So I think the prior speakers have highlighted all of the challenges with climate related hazards. Um, and so I'd like to speak a little bit about prevention. One quick note of disclaimer is that the information I'll share is drawn from my work at the University of Washington and does not represent the views of other organizations I work with or for. So what I'd like to do is to walk through this brief um, uh, diagram here, a combined framework for prevention of climate related hazards, which is not necessarily new ideas, but hopefully will stimulate further discussion today. And if you'd like more information about this approach, um, there's a reference linked on the slide. So here are the examples I'll be using are focused on the effects of excessive occupational heat exposure, including heat related illnesses and potential, potentially exacerbations or manifestations of chronic diseases for which heat or other climate related hazards may be contributing factors. What I won't discuss are the important points brought up by the prior speakers about co-occurring climate related hazards. 
So on the left, panel A, I'm sure you can see the familiar occupational safety and health hierarchy of controls, which presents controls on a continuum of sort of the strongest or elimination, which we'll discuss later in the framework of climate change mitigation, to the weakest personal protective equipment or personal cooling strategies, such as cooling vests, which rely on individual behavior. Of course, engineering controls for heat could include shade and air conditioning and administrative controls, shifting work time to earlier in the day before the highest heat periods of the day for outdoor workers, more frequent rest breaks and reducing work pace as internal heat generation from physical work contributes to occupational heat stress. One important thing to keep in mind, I think, as we deal with this complex landscape of climate related hazards is care to not introduce risk factors for other adverse occupational health outcomes while attempting to mitigate these climate related issues. So for example, changing outdoor work organization to include night work in order to reduce heat exposure may introduce risk factors for injuries such as reduced visibility and disruption of sleep, which in and of itself can impact worker well-being in other ways. So the hierarchy of controls is of course intended to focus on the workplace and doesn't consider those important factors um, that Dr. Uh, Sorensen mentioned just a few minutes ago outside of the workplace that influence occupational health and occupational health inequities, which I think we'll discuss more in the Q&A portion of this webinar. So the right panel, panel B, is CDC's social ecological model, here, hereby all called SEM, which has been adapted for occupational health and incorporates not only individual, interpersonal, and employer level factors, but also community level factors with the underlying idea that addressing just one level for prevention is not sufficient. So examples of interpersonal factors in, for heat include the buddy system to identify early signs of heat stress that individuals may not be aware of due to the effects of heat stress on the brain and community factors, including public cooling opportunities and housing conditions. And so though neither is sufficient, the hierarchy of controls and SEM frameworks, and there are other frameworks out there as well, inform one another through relationships shown with the dotted lines that we won't talk about right now due to time. So to return to the strongest control in the hierarchy of controls framework, hazard elimination or at least reduction, I'd like to discuss something that's a little out of the box, so conservation informed land use planning and the built environment, which has already been raised. So what is conservation informed land use planning and how does it relate to occupational health? This is something I've come to appreciate through multi-sector and transdisciplinary global collaborations and with the conservation sector. So conservation informed land use planning in this context involves characterizing the most promising land use strategies from a conservation perspective that may also reduce the risk of adverse health effects, including adverse occupational health effects, for use in land use decision making. So for example, different land use scenarios that involve forests in rural tropical agricultural subsistence settings could influence occupational health through a combination of local cooling in the short term. So for example, shade as a sort of nature-based control combined with contributions to climate change mitigation. So reduction in heat exposure itself, including outside of the rural uh, tropical area as these forests also absorb greenhouse gases and their exceptionally high carbon sequestration means that conserving these habitats or avoiding deforestation is critical for achieving global emissions goals and contributing to climate change mitigation in the long term. An example in the urban setting combines elements of the built environment with prevention through design, where prevention considerations are included up front. So, for example, roofing construction workers are often exposed to ambient heat as well as high metabolic demands, and depending on the process used additionally to point sources of heat and may also be exposed to heat from urban heat island effects at work and at home. So to best protect worker health and promote well-being, adaptation strategies could account for the roofing process type. So prioritizing processes that get the job done, but also have the least worker heat exposure from point sources and the degree to which the type of roof may reduce urban heat island effects. So prioritizing cooler roofs. This type of approach would also require transdisciplinary collaborations, which I think are critical for this work. So importantly, many aspects of climate related hazards, hazard prevention are beyond the control of an individual worker. And so intervention approaches must therefore ultimately address overarching policies or other systemic changes at the workplace and other levels, which Dr. Sorensen also mentioned. And there's a lot of interesting policy work that is ongoing, um, particularly for heat. And that's indicated um, in panel C. And so I'll stop there and turn it back over to Marianne.
Thank you to our guests for those fascinating presentations. Um, we will now spend the remaining of our time answering questions from the audience. As a reminder, please submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to answer all the questions. And I do already see a question for um, Dr. Sorensen here. Uh, Cecilia, if you could please answer this question here, I can read it for you. Um, what types of analytical methods do you use or do you see being useful for addressing these type of compound exposures? Thank you so much, Marianne. Uh, sorry, Marianne. I think there's, there's a lot of really interesting work going on in this space. Um, and I think in the approach, we have to be thinking about quantitative uh, methods as well as qualitative methods, because there's so much that we don't know about uh, the lived experience of workers who are grappling with climate related events and climate exposures. And so I think we need to be thinking about how can qualitative research really play a role in this um, rather than just the quantitative. So just stepping back, I think that's really important um, in addressing these issues. The other piece of this is, you know, thinking about how can we use traditional exposure studies that we do in worker populations, but add the lens to that of bringing, you know, meteorologic and environmental variables into them, as well as thinking about how can we work with the climate modeling community to start being able to project these risks. I think a lot of our planning is really based on historical reference points, right? You know, we've lived in a very stable climate for the past several hundred years, um, but what we have to know is that moving forward, um, we cannot depend on, on past stable climate experience to know what is going to happen in the future. So for that reason, I think it's really important that we understand, you know, even with what we know at a, at a baseline about worker health, how is climate going to impact the things that we are currently taking for granted? Um, I'm sure my panelists have something to add to this as well. I might add uh, just to that, uh, I think that was uh, right on point. I might add that to, to contribute to that kind of analysis, we're going to need to see uh, more in the way in, in the occupational safety and health field of systems thinking and the skills related to systems thinking. Also, uh, the uh, transdisciplinary approaches uh, that were, were mentioned need to be much more prominent. Uh, learning to work uh, better with other disciplines by respecting their paradigms, learning their terminology, and uh, not working in parallel, but working on common aspects of problems, drawing on the strengths of each of those disciplines. So I think uh, critically, we're going to need th those kinds of tools as well. Thank One you. thing I would add is that there, for analyses that involve projections and modeling studies, there is still a lot of work I think that needs to be done generally in understanding uncertainty in various aspects of projections so related to adaptive capacity to the populations, um, to depending on the hazard of concern, sort of how that exposure relates to disease going forward. And so I'll put in the chat, there's a, a nice paper about this that sort of breaks it down. But I think particularly in the occupational context for planning purposes, those aspects of uncertainty, they're super challenging, but I think um, a lot of work could be done there to sort of help move things forward. Thank you, June. And actually, thank you. You segued uh, into the next question where somebody uh, requested some suggested published uh, review article or any other work you may have. So either of the panelists, feel free to uh, drop down any uh, particular papers that you think that the audience could benefit from. We do have another question from Dr. Swanson about the interaction of climate change and chronic health conditions. As um, we know that chronic conditions is one of the major focus for NIOSH's um, Healthy Work Design Council. So this is a great question on how um, we can understand the role of climate change in terms of chronic conditions. Can any of you speak to that, please? Yeah, absolutely, I can jump in. Um, so 
you know, I think climate change is having a huge impact on non-communicable diseases and, and chronic disease um, in the U.S. as well as globally. Just as an example, we know that air pollution is currently the fifth or fourth leading cause of death worldwide and is currently being driven primarily by the burning of fossil fuels. And so we know that um, the drivers of climate change in and of themselves are having huge impacts on chronic disease. Um, and those impacts are felt through the escalation of cardiovascular diseases, the acceleration of microvascular diseases, such as diabetes, such as hypertension, um, when our areas have higher rates of um, COVID-19 mortality, we see that those areas also have very high levels of air pollution because we know that air pollution um, has some effects on ACE inhibitors, receptors, um, ACE, ACE receptors in the lungs, which make COVID-19 more virulent in individuals. And so the way that air pollution is impacting health is, is, very, uh, is very deep and it's occurring almost everywhere in the world. Um, we're also seeing with climate change that there's more wildfires. And we know that wildfires release all different types of chemicals um, as well as particulate matter into the air and can travel thousands of miles away. Uh, we've been seeing a large increase in wildfires in the US as well as globally as a result of uh, prolonged drought and high temperatures, um, as well as uh, land management practices. Although we know that the climate factors actually win out in terms of um, causality and attribution of the increased um, number of wildfires that we're seeing. Um, so I say air pollution is, is you know, one way that we see climate change um, making things work. And we know that with higher temperatures, as Dr. Schultz mentioned, we see higher levels of ozone. Um, and workers are exposed to these, um, exposed to air pollution everywhere, both on the job, as well as when they're commuting to get to work, as well as they're at home. Um, and so that's just one way that we're seeing climate change impact the health of not just workers, but of, of everybody. I might add one other thing too, that in, indeed uh, chronic disease and, and climate change effects are related. And in fact, they're overlapping. And what we're going to need to see, I think, and, and it was alluded to in some of the other presentations are uh, integrated uh, in, interventions that not only uh, look at the hazards of climate change, and climate related uh, exposures, but also look at those factors that, lead, that contribute to chronic diseases. And in some cases, uh, it may be more effective to uh, address them societally in, in a comprehensive way rather than in a speciated way. Absolutely. And I think, you know, specifically talking about air pollution, you know, addressing air pollution exposure at work can be a, 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 can really have a large health benefit. You know, even if sort of an individual, let's say they, they live near a highway or they're exposed to high levels of air pollution at home, if you have an indoor work environment that has great air quality and they're spending eight to nine hours a day there, you know, that could have a huge impact on, on someone's you know, ultimate quality of life, right, and their health. So I think, you know, as, as in the occupational space, we have an ability to create really safe environments that might even be safer than where workers are coming from. So I completely agree, we need to address this systematically as a society, but also, you know, can we have a model whereby workplaces are healthy places, right? And I think that's what we all ultimately I think too, just simply having, casting a wide net on what is meant by burden. So I think a lot of the times there'll be a particular health outcome that's examined like heat related illnesses to describe the burden say of heat exposure. Yet we know based on Dr. Sorensen's comments and the literature that's out there that folks with underlying diabetes, um, underlying cardiovascular disease may have exacerbations of those diseases or for smoke, you know, folks with underlying asthma or underlying chronic obstructive pulmonary disease may have exacerbations. Yet those cases not, are not necessarily all aggregated into what actually the burden of that particular hazard is. So I think thinking about the burden in sort of a broader sense would also help in terms of understanding what the, what the problem is and kind of all of those different chronic diseases that actually come into play for a particular hazard. Thank you for that. And I think you, you, you all three um, touch upon the question related to what can be done on um, the employer side, right, to, to mitigate this issue or um, prevent 
poor health outcomes for the workers relating to climate change. Is there anything else you would like to add in terms of what employers can do to protect the workers? Well, yes. You know, I, I think. Go ahead, Cecilia. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. Okay, I, I was just saying that, well, what they have to do is uh, treat climate related hazards uh, the way we traditionally treat other hazards as a start. In other words, they have to anticipate and recognize and, and plan to control them. And so we need uh, employers to be uh, anticipating what's going to happen in their workplace uh, to their workers under different kinds of climatic conditions. Uh, and then identify what kind of controls uh, might be effective in that regard. So, so they need to start treating uh, climate-related hazards as, uh, as priorities in their control strategy. Yeah, and just to add to that, you know, this, this is a really brand new field and we need to be thinking about, you know, doing this type of analysis at the industry level, you know, what certain industries have certain climate related risks, but also at the geographic level, because what we know about the impacts of climate change on health is that they're incredibly variable across even the nation, across even the state, right? If you're coastal, you're going to be dealing with more flooding, right? If you are in an urban environment, you're going to be having more urban heat events, right? And so there, there really needs to be a very local approach to this on behalf of of employers to understand what those risks are. Yeah, thank you for that. And when we're talking about variability, it's important, right? Because you, you mentioned variability in terms of region, but we didn't even get to talk about particular worker group. You touched upon industry, but um, it's, it's unfortunate, you know, in terms of time, because this definitely could be a long conversation. We do have a question here. This is specifically for Dr. Schultz. Um, is can you please elaborate on the types of health impacts that we are seeing from the emerging industries that you mentioned? Well, there, you could you could uh, sort of look at them in terms of uh, those that are uh, the direct effects of those, such as uh, or climbing windmills and, uh, and uh, falls from heights related to uh, windmill maintenance. Those are, or, or uh, getting burned or electrical shocks in solar panel farm maintenance. Those are direct effects. But then there are also the indirect effects, the anxiety and the resulting mental health uh, issues that will arise from people who are anxious about their jobs, uh, who are concerned whether they are in a, a, a sector that is being targeted by society to phase out so that uh, more climate friendly uh, things can go in. I think a lot of the concern about the what's going on with the coal industry it, it illustrates that 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 it, and it's not just the workers in coal mines. It's all the related um, uh, businesses uh, in the regions of those mines that are supported by those people. They're all suffering a a uh, emerging. Uh, problem, uh, a, a problem related to uh, the effects of climate change and anticipating a transition from, from fossil fuel to non-fossil fuel. So I think uh, we, we need that. And then finally, I'll just say um, there's a growing literature on small nuclear plants. And so we may see a lot more nuclear activity as a transitional, as a transitional uh, effort. Uh, and we know that from the mining to the uh, end, uh, uh, and uh, of the process where uh, spent uh, nuclear material is then transitioned out, we know that there are a lot of occupational hazards there. And with smaller plants and more of them coming potentially coming online, a lot of what we thought was not uh, 
was well under control with nuclear energy is going to have to be rethought and and reconsidered. So those are the kind of things that happen when we see the emergence and the transition from uh, one technology to the other. And you could you could really drill down in each of those and in other related areas. Thank you so much, Paul, for this important information. Um, let's keep going with the questions. We have some wonderful ones that are coming in. Um, one question is, what are some of the greatest barriers to a heat standard and what needs to be known to convince policymakers to support a standard? I could take a first stab at that. You know, my suspect is that these are these are economic barriers because if we set certain seat, certain heat standards saying that you know if it gets above a certain temperature workers have to stop working that impacts the employer but it also impacts the worker right especially those who are getting paid based on what they produce there's some great data that was recently published um, in the Lancet countdown looking at worker productivity and heat exposure and um, suggests that we've lost hundreds of millions of hours of labor as a result of rising temperatures particularly in the south and the southern regions of the United States but this phenomena is happening globally so that's that's part of the barrier is that it's going to slow down productivity it's going to slow down work and Generally, people don't like that. I think the other part of this is that we're still trying to understand what are safe limits of heat exposure? Because when you have someone, especially who's doing manual labor, you have their internal heat generation, which is additive with ambient heat exposure. And then you could even add to that if they're working near machinery, which is producing heat. So then knowing that it's not just you know straight you know what's the wet bulb globe temperature there's other factors that contribute to this in addition to the fact that individuals have their own risk factors for example do they have underlying heart disease or respiratory disease it's very hard to find a one size fits all temperature to say okay at, at this point we have to stop work so i think it's complicated and i think because of that complication um and the fact that it has economic implications that this has become uh, a difficult topic um but i'm sure my other speakers have more insights on this just one follow-on to that um i think Part of the reason that we're not seeing societies moving fast enough to uh, address the, the climate crisis is because a lot of the kind of information that Dr. Sorensen was just talking about, the, the impact on productivity has really not been widely communicated. Uh, possibly the, the, the body of underlying research is, is not sufficient enough, but, there, but even what's out there tells a, a, a strong story that there's gonna be lots of productivity decrements and uh, society is going to be paying for this uh, in, 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 you know, people are, are grousing about paying for uh, dealing with climate change when they're going to be paying even though they don't know it. So uh, I think it's critical that, that we promote this kind of research as well as do it. And I think the other piece that we need to bring to light is that if you have workers who continue to work despite being exposed to extreme heat, they suffer health impacts that further decrease their productivity, right? And this is something that we observed in studying chronic kidney disease of unknown origin in Mesoamerica is that those workers who start to have decline in their kidney function, um, a contributor to that being heat exposure and repeated dehydration, they end up cutting less sugar cane, right? They keep working, they keep getting paid the same, but they're cutting less sugar cane. So, you know, it's it's not actually gonna favor us in the long term to be exposing workers to heat because our workers are going to get sick. And, you know, I think we need to have um, better data, a better understanding of this, but that that is that is paramount that really, you know, when we start seeing the first health harms of heat, it's often because workers just slow down um, and that's the body's response to protect itself from injury. Thank you for that. I um, will continue down the list of these wonderful questions here. This one actually um, relates to indigenous populations. Um, so worldwide, indigenous populations are disproportionately impacted by climate change. So in what ways are all three of you, um, if any, are engaged with local indigenous people to learn about their experience and their solutions relating to climate change? That is such a great question. 
I think I read a statistic recently that 80% yeah. of the remaining biodiversity on the planet is being protected by something about between like, you know, two and 4% of the population, which is in the indigenous population. And so we know that we have an incredible amount of information and knowledge that we could learn from those caregivers of the land um, that know how to keep the environment alive and healthy and thriving. And what, you know, my experience, and I don't work directly with indigenous populations in the occupational realm, but is that, you know, there is, this constant pressure of exploitive industries that uh, continue to threaten um, indigenous land and land and water rights. And so, you know, I think that there's a lot of advocacy that needs to be done there um, in order to promote the health um, and the worker health of indigenous people so they can continue to, to, to thrive and, and, uh, and keep, keep their, their role as guardians of, of the biodiversity that we have left. Um, but no, I don't work directly with uh, indigenous populations in terms of occupational health, but I'd welcome anybody who does to, to comment. I can share. Um, here in Washington state, there are some grassroots organizations and um, labor unions who do um, work with indigenous populations. And I've been directly involved with projects that are community driven and that involve approaches that were developed by the community with goals developed by the community, um, approaches such as digital stories to learn more about the experience of indigenous workers. And I think there's, you know, there's a lot more to be done, um, but I do think that there's, there's a, a critical need um, for those types of approaches to be more broadly integrated into the work that we're doing. Uh, I too uh, don't work uh, directly with indigenous peoples, but I agree with what uh, Dr. Spector just said that we we could learn an awful lot if we did integrate a kind of information into our thinking and into the discussions. Uh, but I also think that uh, what's been happening with indigenous people in terms of the impact of climate uh, opens the whole door of, of health equity. Uh, that we uh, alluded to earlier, that there are populations uh, of workers uh, due to socioeconomic and other uh, demographic determinants who are disproportionately affected by climate uh, change in general. And some of those workers, some of those people who, who are workers from those populations have uh, not only that, in general, a disproportionate effect, but then add on to that the specific effects from the work that they're doing. And so indeed, we're seeing that the, the health disparities that are rife in society uh, play out in the workplace in relation to uh, not only the classic hazards, but now the hazards related to climate. Thank you, thank you for, for, for that. Um, I just wanted to put in a plug that if you are interested in getting the slides, just um, send your request to uh, twh at cdc.gov um, if you want a copy of the slides. But the recording for the webinar will be available. Um, give us a few weeks and we'll make that available um, for you all to access. One question that we receive is, what role might technological changes in the workplace play in climate change and work? Provide some thoughts there. So I think for some of the hazards we've discussed, like heat and smoke, we know, for example, in rural areas, there is often a lack of monitoring data or information that is local, often that means that there isn't trusted information because there isn't information about the actual area where folks are working. So I think with low cost uh, monitoring and sensor availabilities and networks, we can do a better job to assess risk, um, particularly for workers who may be disproportionately affected. And now of course, there's a lot of opportunities using uh, smartphones and mobile applications for the management portion. So addressing the risk, um, what comes to mind, you know, EPA is a smoke sense application. Obviously, Ocean NIOSH has their heat um, application as well that helps with decision support in terms of how best to protect workers. So those are a couple of things. Um, another in the heat realm, you know, there's ways to assess um, 
physiological responses to hazards. So heat, for example, and involve estimating core body temperatures without having to measure them invasively. And so this can be nice because for an expo for a health effect like that, there's actually multiple different sources of exposure from the internal heat generation to the ambient environment. And so a measure that can actually kind of put all that together and help with decision support can be helpful. I think the downside of some of, the, of some of those approaches though is of course thinking about privacy for workers and confidentiality as we start to think about how, how best to utilize those technologies. I, I think too, uh, there are a lot of hazards that we've identified today in this discussion. Uh, and there's very little technology that's been tested and invented or tested to address these hazards. There are some notable examples. I think uh, it's critical that we start to uh, really emphasize the importance of intervention development and intervention effectiveness research involved with uh, applying different technologic approaches to uh, mitigating these hazards. And uh, I think that's that's going to be critical. We heard uh, certainly that uh, the area of uh, sensor technology and monitoring uh, is useful. And it might be that it, and it needs to be that it should be applied not just to heat, but across the board to a variety of different kinds of hazards related to climate. And uh, again, reiterating the point that was made earlier that workers aren't exposed to any one of these hazards, they're exposed to a multiplicity of them. It's a cumulative effect. And, uh, but I think, I think we're not doing near enough in the area of emphasizing intervention effectiveness uh, research, uh, utilizing uh, new technologies as well as other administrative practices and, and, and organization of work kinds of practices. Cecilia, anything to add before I move on to the next question for that? I think you can move on to the next question. I think that was really well. Great. Um, so can you speak as to whether outreach and education play a role in raising awareness among doctors, employers, and workers to help understand the impact chronic diseases play or challenges face regarding exposure to these environmental climate and climate conditions? That's a great question. You know, I think that we need to be doubling down on making sure that all, all health professionals have an understanding of, of work-related exposures. You know, for example, I'm an emergency medicine physician and uh, I was working in an area in Northern Colorado where there's high amounts of fracking, there's a lot of the meat packing industry. And when we are not understanding the environment that our workers are coming from, um, we're not making the right diagnoses and we're not giving the right guidance as to how people can protect themselves. And so I would say, you know, we need broad-based education about the health impacts of climate change for all health professionals, that being nurses, pharmacists, doctors, et cetera, um, and with a lens to occupational health, because we know that you know, those are environments where patients spend a lot of their time. So I think that we really need to focus on kind of broad-based education around that. So that's one of the things we work on at the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education at Columbia University is, is strategically thinking about how we can integrate these types of uh, this type of knowledge and skill into the training of health professionals. And, and then to that question, asker's point, you know, this information also needs to go out to workers, right, in a way that they can understand what the risks are to their own health so that they can work creatively within their own um, personal constraints to, to be able to protect themselves. So that's a great question. And we need more education everywhere. I think now too, there's been more along Dr. Dr. Schulte's comments now, there's starting to be literature now evaluating the effectiveness of certain education and training interventions or programs, particularly those that are participatory and co-developed with the worker population of interest, so tailored. Um, so I think that's an area for further research, but there's some coming out, I know, um, on heat. Um, the other piece around um, healthcare providers, I think thinking broadly about healthcare providers is is great too, thinking about um, community health workers and um, home health programs in addition to maybe what 
comes to mind initially is sort of to like in a clinic setting. Again, I think those healthcare providers are sort of critical in, um, in supporting messaging that goes out, are spending time in the environment where workers are living and, and working, as opposed to when folks come into a hospital or a clinic setting and trying to reconstruct all of that, which of course would be ideal if all healthcare providers could ask all the right questions and really understand the occupational health issues and what people are doing for work. Um, but I do think thinking broadly about healthcare providers that can work together to sort of share these messages is, is another thing to think about. And of course, I think the critical audience is the employer. And indeed, uh, it's the employer's responsibility to provide a safe and healthy workplace. And yet, we don't target the employers as much as we should. And it, it, this is where I think the opportunity to uh, present to employers and to educate employers on the importance of thinking of the array of climate hazards uh, which are all layered on to the already aging population and the uh, underlying chronic disease burden. So we're seeing these two major hazards as going to uh, continue to shape the health of the workforce and work in the future. And we're not thinking broadly enough or we're not uh, we're not communicating broadly enough to employers about the intersection of these issues and the need for them to do more in terms of addressing them and, and in part it really requires a total worker health uh, approach uh, to deal with uh, each of these things that we've talked about individually Yeah, definitely. And speaking of employers that you just mentioned here, um, uh, Rob McLean actually made a, a comment, if you will, about the role of employers in supporting public health um, when it comes to addressing climate change. Can you add a little bit more to his comment? He's definitely suggesting that uh, employers need to do that. Um, anything you would like to add? Well, just uh, I think that's right on, in line with what I was saying, and I think it's incumbent upon us in, in the occupational and public health communities to uh, have more of a strategy for reaching trade associations and employer groups and, and uh, interacting with them to find the kind of information that they need, certainly to promote the information that we talked about earlier about the productivity decrements. I, I think all are the kind of things that that will move them so that then they will will push back to the public health community and our funding sources and say, we need to see more research on this kind of effort. And so I think that's, that, that is right on point. It was muted. Um, thank you so much. It is, we are exactly out of time. Um, it is exactly 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, please do check the chat. There have been some great resources that have been shared in terms of uh, articles, please make sure you get those. A big thank you to our presenters and to everyone who joined us today. We invite you to stay connected with us through our website and social media and to sign up for the Total Worker Health in Action newsletter and to stay up to date on the latest news from our program and partners. Again, you can put in your request to have access to the slides. And the recording for this webinar will be available at a later date in a few, uh, in a few weeks. Um, everyone, thank you again and have a, a great rest of your day.